hey, guess what? It's not about us. It's all about him this morning. So uh, we welcome you to our worship this morning. And hey, happy Father's Day to those fathers out there. So uh, appreciate, uh, uh, we've got to appreciate fathers. But we need a lot of help too, so be praying for us. <laughs> That's for sure. Hey, just a reminder, uh, this Saturday morning leadership and ladies ministry meet at 730 here at the church. And had another good Friday, handing out uh, food uh, uh, sacks for the weekend for our youth here in McGuffey and had over 30 kids. So uh, that's the third week, and every every week is, is more. So that's a great uh, uh, evangelistic outreach, and uh, it's a good good touch to the, to the kids here in this community. So uh, we're grateful and thankful for that. If you're uh, visiting with us today, we do uh, we do partake in, in communion each week, and uh, we do it towards the end of the service. But we're not passing the the trays around due to COVID. So there's emblems on the table in front of the sound room at the back of the sanctuary if you need to pick those up to participate in communion with us. Moving to our prayer time, uh, need to continue to pray for uh, Mary Inman Burkett. This is the young lady that David and uh, Carl have been ministering to, and, and he'll say more about that later, I'm sure. But she's fighting cancer, and they've only given her a few days to live, so we need to be praying for her and her family. Also, uh, the families of uh, Joyce Tuttle, Nick Dyer, and Ashley Doty, they have all lost their lives here recently, and uh, be in prayer for those families. A uh, couple blessings, though. Lexi Wall was in a car accident. That's uh, Kayleen's uh, niece, and uh, the car didn't uh, do too well, but uh, she came out okay pretty much, had a few stitches, but that's it. So praise uh, God that she wasn't injured. And uh, Aileen took a little fall this week, but uh, she's okay, and she's here, and you, you won't notice it. No, you won't notice she took a fall, not at all, but we're just glad, we're just, we're just uh, very pleased that uh, she uh, doesn't have any major injuries from that fall, so we're grateful for that. Anybody else we need to mention before we begin our service? Yes, Teresa? Um, okay. Albert Prater, Eldon, Eldon Prater, uh, can, uh, liver cancer, you said? Okay. And then your husband, Barry, Barry Harden, uh, uh, got a long, long road to recovery from a surgery, so be in prayer for those as well. I'm going to uh, begin our service today with a prayer, but it's something I came across in my readings this morning I want to share with you. Uh, it's a prayer for Father's Day, so let's pray. Dear God, you have said reverence for God gives a, a man deep strength. And what we need today are men with deep strength. Help us to build our firm foundation on Jesus Christ. When everybody else is running the race for acquisitions, achievements, accomplishments, appearance, help us to remember that what matters most is love. To love you and to love our wives, our kids, our families, our friends, and even our enemies. Help us to remember, Jesus, that you said our care for others is a measure of our greatness. Help us to give our lives away and learn what it means to really live. We realize that everything else is going to pass away, but the man who does the will of God will live forever. Most importantly, we pray that you give these men a new sense of courage, the courage to stand alone, to be a man of honor, to be strong, and do everything in love. We pray this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.
is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy.
morning, church. We've had a uh, <clears throat> great week. Uh, tell you a little bit more about that later today. But uh, it's been a good week, been a trying week. But uh, God really done some amazing things this week, and we're just really happy that we can be part of uh, His plan. You know, one of the most uh, powerful stories in the history of the Olympic Games involved a <clears throat> canoeing specialist named Bill Havens. Now, Bill was a shoe in to win gold medal in the 1924 Olympics in Paris. But a few months before the games were held, he learned that his wife would be giving birth to their first child while he was away at the Olympics. And she told him she could make it on her own, but this was a milestone for Bill, and he didn't want to miss it. So he surprised everyone and stayed home, and Bill greeted his infant son, Frank Havens, into the world on August 1st, 1924. And although he always wondered what might have been, he said he never regretted being there for the birth of his son. Now, Bill Havens poured his life into his son and shared with him a love and respect for the sport of canoeing. Twenty-four years passes, and the Olympic Games were held in Helsinki, Finland. This time, Bill's son, Frank Havens, was chosen to compete in the canoeing event. And the day after the competition, Bill received a telegram for his son, and it said these words, Dear Dad, thanks for waiting around for me to be born in 1924. Dad, I'm coming home with the gold medal that you should have won. And it was signed, your son, lovingly Frank. Now, you know, many, many would question Bill Haven's decision to miss his big opportunity in Paris, but he never wavered. He wanted his family to know that they always came first, no matter what. And that made him a hero to a little boy named Frank. Friends, I want to urge you today, and I want to try to inspire you today, one of the most urgent domestic challenges that we face in the United States today, especially in our bigger cities, is the re recreation of fatherhood as a social role for men. We've got to get our children back home. A good father does three basic things. He provides for his family, he protects his family, and he gives spiritual and moral guidance. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, the beautiful cool weather, the, the beautiful sunshine that's coming in here. Father, we thank you for our praise team, or those who are watching today, our elders, our deacons, everybody. It's just uh, a step back today and just look at all the blessings you've given us here in McGuffey. It's just amazing, Lord, how you continue to show us your blessings you know, and, and help us to stay obedient to your calling. Father, I pray for those who aren't here today that you would watch over them, those traveling for summertime, pray for that. We also pray for a hedge of protection, Lord, for this congregation as we continue to move forward. We've got some awesome upcoming events coming up, Lord, with our blog party. You know that. I don't have to tell you that. But we're just asking for your presence there. Your presence in the fact that people can see Jesus living in our lives as we hand them food or, or take some trash out. Just anything, Lord God, that would glorify you. We praise you and we thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome, everyone. Today is Father's Day, and it's a day we celebrate our fathers for all that they do for their families and all the sacrifices made to ensure that a family is taken care of on a day-to-day -day basis. The institution of Father's Day is credited to a woman by the name of Sonora Dodd. She wanted a special day to honor her father, Henry Jackson Smart. Her father was widowed when, when his wife died during the birth of their sixth child. Mr. Smart was left to raise the newborn and his other five children by himself on a rural farm in eastern Washington State. And as an adult, Sonora realized the sacrifice her father had shown in raising his children as a single parent. In the eyes of his daughter, he was a courageous and loving and selfless man. He was her hero. In 1910, Sonora Dodd started writing letters in support of a National Father's Day observance. In 1916, President Woodrow Wilson proposed that Father's Day be proclaimed as a National Day of Observance. In 1924, President Calvin Coolidge endorsed the same idea. And in 1926, a National Father's Day committee was formed in New York City. In 1956, the Father's Day was recognized by a joint resolution of Congress. And in 1966, President Lyndon Johnson signed a presidential proclamation declaring the third Sunday of June as Father's Day. And in 1972, President Richard Nixon established a permanent national observance of Father's Day to be held on the third Sunday in June. You know, today for fathers, it's a day of cologne, a day of hugs, new neckties, long distance phone calls and Hallmark cards, or in my case, I got an awesome chainsaw. <laughs> I, about kill myself, but I played with it all day yesterday. You can come see it. It's awesome. 
His, I, mean, I can't get over how much a chainsaw means to me. I took it on a ride and we talked. <laughs> but, but today for myself, unfortunately, uh, today for myself and my brother, and uh, my brother Danny, my brother Tim, and, and our mother, today is our sixth Father's Day without my dad. For 48 years, we had a good one. And he's gone now. And he's buried in a beautiful spot in the Round Ted Cemetery. And even though he is gone, friends, his presence is very near, especially today on Father's Day. You see, it, stra- it seems strange to me, but I guess that's because he was never gone. He was always close by. He was always available, always present. His, his words were nothing novel. His achievements admirable were nothing extraordinary. But his presence for his children and his wife was like a warm fireplace in a large house. My dad was a source of comfort. And like a sturdy porch swing or a big branch down in the backyard, he could always be found and leaned upon. And during my adolescence, dad was one of the parts of my life that was so predictable. Girlfriends came and girlfriends went, but dad was there. Football season turned into baseball season and turned into football season again, and dad was there. Summer vacations, homecoming dates, high school, first car, family reunions, and birthdays, they all had one thing in common. My dad was there. The car always ran, the bills always got paid, and the lawn stayed mowed because my father was there. His laughter was fresh, not often. His laughter was fresh, but we knew the future was secure because he was there. Because he was there, we kids never worried about things like income tax or saving accounts or monthly bills or mortgages. Those were things on dad's desk. We always knew he loved us. He corrected us. He chuckled at Archie Bunker and he read the paper every evening and he helped my mother do the dishes. I never missed a day. In the 21 years I was home, my father never missed an evening where he did not help my mother do the dishes. But he didn't do anything unusual. He only did what dads are supposed to do, be there. He taught me how to shave and he taught me that wrongs should be punished and that rights have a reward. He modeled the importance of getting up early and working hard to provide for his family. Was he flawless? Absolutely not. He was not flawless. He was a sinner saved by grace like you and I. And he comes to mind often to me. And I knew if I ever needed him, he'd be there. And he was, like I said, like a warm fireplace. But when you think about it, maybe for me, that's why Father's Day is a bit chilly. You know, the fire's going out. The winds of age have swallowed the, the flame. And it leaves only a little golden ember for me to see. But friends, there's a strange thing about those embers. You stir them, and that flame will dance. It will dance only briefly, but it will dance, and it will knock just enough chill out of the air to remind me that my dad is still very much present in my life. Let's go to the Word of God. Let's go. If you have your Bibles read this morning, let's go to 1 Kings, the second chapter. Let's go to 1 Kings, the second chapter, where King David has some counsel for his son in time of uncertainty for Israel. And King David is about to pass the baton of leadership onto his son Solomon. But before he does, he wants to pass on some great advice. Let's read God's word, 1 Kings 2, chapter 1 through 2, and it says this. When the time drew drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. I am about to go the way of the all the earth, he said, so be strong, act like a man. In other words, what David was saying, be a man of strength, be a man of character. But the question is, what is a man? You laugh, but this day and age, what is a man? Sometimes we're confused by that. But what is a man? Look at verses 3. 1 Kings 2, 3. And observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands. His laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. Friends, if you want to show yourself a man, first thing we can talk about this morning is we need to be men of God. We need to be men of God. Dr. James Dobson reports that the average preschool child watches between 30 and 50 hours of television per week while the average time spent interacting with his father is what? 37 seconds a day. Dobson has also said there is no higher calling on earth for a man than to be a father. The Christian group, uh, we really enjoy it. In October, we're actually going to go see these people. But the Christian group, uh, Casting Crowns, has a song called American Dream. And, and it tells about a man that spends all of his time trying to get ahead so that he can provide the good life. 
take care of his family the good way. And one day he realizes he's lost everything and it has all been in vain. And the song says, all they really wanted was you. Fathers, ask yourself the question this morning. How much time have I spent with my family in the past week? Fathers, we have to keep God's words. We have to keep his commands. But more importantly, we have to practice them daily. You see, guys, splitting time with work, family, and your job can be tough. And it can sometimes stretch your limits when you're trying to provide for your family and striving to be a man that God desires you to do. I'm not asking you to quit slacking off on your work. Not at all. I'm just asking we give our family priority. Preacher in Dallas went to the hospital to visit a little boy who was seriously ill. When he walked into the room, he found the boy's parents with him. And he says, we talked for a while, and the parents had just received some pretty tough news and wasn't encouraging, and they were deeply concerned about their young six-year-old boy. You see, he had a tumor removed from his brain two days before, and they had just been told that the tumor was malignant. Now, long periods of treatment loomed before them, and no one was sure what the end result would be for this little guy. And it was very difficult for both of them, but as we stood there together and talked and cried a little bit and prayed together, I think the most beautiful thing that I'd seen in a long time kind of unfolded. The little boy, partially sedated, would open his eyes on occasion and whimper a little bit, and his daddy would reach over and stroke his hand and touch him and, and speak gentle words to him, and the little guy would go back to sleep. And as the preacher got ready to leave, the boy's father said, Preacher, he said, you know, the hardest part of this has been to see the other three children at home. Someone has to take care of them while we're at the hospital. And we're so torn, we need to be here with Dane, but we feel like we're neglecting our other three. And he said, I went home the other night and showered and changed my clothes to come back to the hospital. And the other three were crying. Daddy, don't leave. Don't leave us again. And he said, I had to take each of them and reassure them that we would all be together again as soon as a family. You see, friends, that really is something special. To see a father who cares so much about his children that it breaks his heart that he can't spend as much time as he needs with them. You see, it's important, guys. It's important for us to communicate the love of God in a way that we show our children. But it's one thing to tell our children we love them. It's a whole other level to let them see us love him. Dad's everything we do matters. Everything we do, the way we confront a situation, the way we speak to others, the way we dress, the way we carry ourselves, the way we handle a family crisis, our children are watching every move we make. And they're the ones who see us truly for who we are. You want to know one of the fastest ways for a child to rethink the whole Christianity? A hypocritic Christian parent. We need to show children our flaws. But we also need to show them on our knees asking for forgiveness from those flaws. And we can't be afraid to do that. We cannot say we love God and live a life that is unpleasing to Him because our children witness our walk with Jesus Christ. And contrary to popular belief, it's not about what makes us happy, but what makes us holy that truly changes lives. It's not easy, but it's a blessing to be redefined on our walk with Jesus and have our children witness repentance, sacrifice, forgiveness, and love. Just like Jesus setting an example is a crucial for our children, we must lean on Christ. But just because you're a Christian to lean on Jesus doesn't mean your children are. I've said this before and I'll say it. God has no grandchildren. I can't get you into my children into heaven. They can't get me into heaven. He has no grandchildren. And I think one of the toughest things we as a nation face today, and I'll go out on a limb and say this, is our colleges... The indoctrination of some of our colleges in this country is outstanding. It's crazy. But here's the point. Guys, we send, our, we send our children off to Caesar and we're shocked when they come back as a Roman. That's the institutions we're battling against today. We've got to get our kids home. We've got to get them home. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Titus 2 says, similarly, encourage the young man to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show them integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. I thank God every day that I've got the wife I have because I fail my children every day. And she says sometimes, hey, go talk to him. You know, go tell him what's going on, you know. 
We're lucky to have partners like that as we raise our children. You want to be a real man, guys? Do the same thing. Do the same thing. Do what you know is to be right, even when it's hard. Practice it daily and prove it true in your own life. Learn for yourself that God's promises are sure. You see, Father, sometimes, sometimes your families just want to be near you. They just want to feel your presence, and they want to feel protected in this crazy world. On September 11th, 2001, the day of the attacks in New York City and across the country, David Frum, one of President George Bush's speechwriters, was driving home on the evening of the tragic act, attack on our nation by terrorists. And as he's driving home, something grew within him. And David wrote that a sudden sense of American ownership gripped over him as never before. He said that suddenly the F-16s flying overhead were his jets. The empty streets in Washington were his streets. The burning twin towers in New York were his towers. The smoking Pentagon was his Pentagon. He said that when he got home, his wife and children ran and embraced him almost in desperation. They were his family. On, the night, on that night, they piled up pillows and sleeping bags, and all of them slept in the living room to be together. And it was amazing to see what an attack from the outside will do to a nation, to a country, but to a family, especially to a father. We have to protect our children and our spouse. Look at 1 Kings 2, chapter 4 here, or verse 4 says, And that the Lord may keep his promise to me, if your descendants watch how they live, and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. That is a promise from our Lord and Savior. And that's what God's promise to David was. And David says to Solomon, prove it true in your own life. The man who keeps God, <clears throat> keeps God worth proves God's promises. Some time ago I was reading about a guy who bought a, a Navy blazer at Nordstrom. It's kind of funny. He took it home, and the whole time he wore it, the more he realized he really didn't like it. It wasn't the right color. It attracted lint. It was out of style. And after wearing it pretty regularly for six months or so, he stuck it in the closet, and he didn't wear it for a longer time soon. But tucked away in the back of his mind all the while was that famous Nordstrom unconditional return policy. And he thought, you know, I've had this thing for a year and a half. I've worn it lots of times. There's just no way they're going to give me my money back. But he decided he had nothing to lose, so he pulls the blazer out, threw it a lot of lint on, <clears throat> onto it to make it look bad, and he took it down to Nordstrom's department store. He walked in and immediately felt nervous. He felt like he was about to pull a scam of some sort, but he kept a straight eye and straight face. He walked in and immediately felt nervous. He walked right up to the first salesman he saw and gave this little prepared speech. He said, I'm about to put your famous unconditional return policy to its ultimate test. He said, I have a blazer here. I've worn it a lot. I've had it for a year and a half, and I really don't care for it anymore. It's the wrong color. It attracts lint. It's out of style. But he said, I really would like to return the blazer. Is that possible? And the salesman just looked at him and shook his head. He said, for heaven's sakes, let's get you a new one. What took so long, he said. Let's go find you a blazer. And 10 minutes later, the once unhappy customer walked out with another blazer that was marked $75, more than the one he had paid for the original time. It was just what he wanted, and it didn't cost him a penny. And why am I telling you an illustration about Nordstrom? I tell you that illustration because, in a way, God is just like Nordstrom. He makes all sorts of promises that we find hard to believe. And then we get in enough desperate situation, we decide to turn to him. And that's when Jesus looks at us and shakes his head and he said, for heaven's sakes, what took you so long? Guys, show yourself a man. Prove God's promises to, in your life and take him up on his word. His word. Whoever believes in me should not perish but have eternal life. Take him up on his word. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Take him up on his word. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Take him up on your word. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Take him up on his word, guys. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Guys, take him up for his word. I will never leave you or forsake you. Guys, take him up for his word.
Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Take him up for his words, guys. Do not let this book meditate. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. And then you will be prosperous and successful. And what am I going to say? Take him up on his words. It doesn't make you a wimp to depend on God to keep his word. On the contrary, it makes you a real man. So live a life of dependence on Christ. Show yourself a man and be a man of his word. And finally, be a man of wisdom. Be a man of wisdom. Be skilled in your dealing with people. Know how to handle all kinds. And that means, first of all, guys, we can't let evil go unpunished in this world. David warns his son Solomon of two people here. Listen to these words from 1 Kings 2, 5, and 6. We see that two people had given him trouble, and the two people he knows will give Solomon trouble unless Solomon deals with them wisely. So he says these words in five, verses 5 and 6. He says, Now you yourself know what Joab, son of Zariah, did to me, what he did to the two commanders of Israel's army, Abner, son of Ner, and Amasa, son of Jether. He killed them, shedding their blood in peacetime as if in battle. And with that blood, he stained about around his waist and the sandals of his feet. Deal with him according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. I'm not advocating murder at all. You see, Job was, gen was David's general who killed a couple of other officers against David's wishes. He killed Abner, Ishbetheth's general, the general for Saul's son who opposed David, he killed them. And Job also killed Amos, one of David's officers. Listen to what David says to his son in, in verses 8 and 9. And remember, you have with you Shimea, son of Gera, the Benjamite from Bahuram, who called down bitter curses on me that day, the day I went to Menahem, when he came down to meet me at the Jordan. I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death by the sword, but now do not consider him innocent. You are a man of wisdom. You will know what to do to him. Bring his gray head down to the grave in blood. Now, Shimei cursed David when he fled the palace from Absalom. And then when David returns, he begs for mercy and David grants him a pardon. But cursing a ruler, friends, was strictly prohibited by God's law in the book of Exodus. And the two needed to be punished. Now keep this in mind, guys. While we explore this Old Testament story here, we're not talking about revenge. We're talking about God's justice. The new king must deal with just, just righteously with people. He can't allow evil to go unpunished. Otherwise, there would be chaos all over the kingdom. Remember, God's developing a world here. Some time ago, Steve Nichols bought his two-year-old daughter Sarah an aquarium. And they went together to the pet store to pick out the, the four fish to put in the tank. And two weeks later, when Sarah was at her grandparents' house, one of the fish died. Steve's wife flushed it down the toilet and didn't tell his daughter about it. Two weeks after that, Sarah found another dead fish. It had gotten caught in one of those little fake plastic branches. And Steve recalled a, he received a call at his office from his wife who told him that Sarah had something to tell him. In her two-year-old way, she explained to her dad that the fish had died. She found it in the bushes, and she and Mommy were going to have a funeral for it in the backyard. We joke about that. But Steve realized this was the first of many losses she would experience in life. And he broke into tears. When the last thing she said to him before hanging up was, Daddy, do you promise, do you promise to not let me get caught in the bushes? That's life. We can't let our kids get caught in the bushes. We can't let our children get swayed by this or swayed by that. We have to keep them focused and grounded and keep them out of the bushes. A real man keeps his family from getting caught in the bushes. Look at these words from 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 7. It says, But show kindness to the son of Barazella of Galead, and let them be among those who eat at your table. They stood by me when I fled from your brother Absalom. You see, these people sustained David in the wilderness. They provided food and supplies when he was a great need. And now David wants to make sure Solomon recognizes their reward and their kindness. Many years ago, two men were working, at their, working their way through Stanford University. And at one point, their money was almost gone to go to school. 
So they decided to invite the great pianist, Padawerski, to do a concert and use the profit to pay their board and tuition. Padawerski's manager asked them for a guarantee of $2,000. And the students worked hard to promote the concert, but they were only able to raise $1,600. And after the performance, they went to the musician, gave him all the money they had, and promised to pay the balance of $400 as soon as they could. But it appeared that their college days at Stanford were over. And Padawerski says, no, boys, that won't do. And he handed the money back. He says, take out of this $1,600 all your expenses and keep for yourself 10%, then let me have the rest. Now, years passed. Padawerski became president or premier of Poland following World War I. And thousands of his countrymen were starving. And only one man could help, the head of the U.S. Food and Relief Bureau, and Padawerski's appeal to him brought thousands and thousands of tons of food. And later, he met the American statesmen who thanked him. That's all right, replied Herbert Hoover. Besides, do you remember when we talked at Stanford? That blessing was about to be repaid because of what that man of God did. Guys, we got to be that man of God. We got to be that man that remembers and rewards and helps people along their journey because that's what real men do. That's what real men do. They remember and repay kindness. Somebody once said, make a habit of getting even with people, not those you think wronged you, but those you know helped you. Amen. Guys, it means to be a man of the word and a man of wisdom. We prove God's word true in our life and prove to others to see our lives. Jimmy and his son David were playing in the ocean in Mexico. While his family, his wife, his daughter and parents and a cousin were on the beach, and suddenly a riptide swept Davy out to sea. And immediately Jimmy started to do whatever he could to help Davy get back to the shore, but it was, too, it was too soon he was swept away in the tide. He knew that in a few minutes both he and David would drown. He tried to scream, but his family couldn't hear him. Now Jimmy's a strong guy. He was an Olympic decathlete, but he was powerless in this situation. And as he was carried along by the water, he had a single chilling thought. My wife and daughter are going to have to have a double funeral. That was his thought. Meanwhile, his cousin, who understood something about the ocean, saw what was happening. He walked out into the water where he knew there was a sandbar. He had learned that if you try to fight a riptide, you're going to die. So he walks to the other sandbar, stood as close as he could get to Jimmy and David, and then just lifted them up onto the sandbar. Come to me, he said. Come to me, and I'll save you. That's a Christian imitation, friends. Come to me when you're drowning. Come to me when you only have a certain amount of time. Come to me at mealtime. Come to me before you go to bed. Thank me. Guys, we've got to bring our kids home. Dads, today is the day to dedicate your life to being the hero your child wants to imitate. Guys, love them like never before. Hold them when they hurt. Laugh when needed. Discipline with love at times. Let them see you fail and teach them about the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Guys, we've got to take our kids back. Let me ask you this. What comes to mind when you hear the name of Jonathan Edwards? Not the politician. This was Jonathan Edwards, the Puritan preacher. Now, most identify his name with the famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I'm sure some of you heard that. But that powerful sermon was preached in 1741. And it initiated what is now called the First Great Awakening. And the legacy Jonathan Edwards left as a father is not nearly as well known as his famous sermon. But the impact of his family leadership may be even more significant in the long run. Edwards married his wife Sarah in 1727, and together they had 11 children. She's a hero. Together they had 11 children. At the turn of the 20th century, American educator and pastor A.E. Winship decided to trace the descendants of Jonathan Edwards almost 150 years after his death. His findings were astonishing. Jonathan Edwards' godly legacy and his striving to be a godly parent and a loving, Christ-filled father includes one U.S. vice president, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 
13 college presidents, 30 judges, 65 professors, 8 public office holders, 100 lawyers, and over 100 preachers and missionaries. Those are the people he had an impact on. And some of those were his children. Guys, that's a powerful example. Reminding parents about their leadership. We've got to bring them home, guys. King David wrote in Psalm 78, he says these words. He established a law in Israel which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. The next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Guys, are you keeping his commands? Traditionally, guys, and, and ladies, I'm sorry, I'm kind of going after your husbands today. Traditionally, I do a, my, my closing. Today, we're going to have a testimony about if you give your life to Christ and if you truly want to help people, it can be done. Carla's going to give a testimony here in a couple seconds. And then we'll come, when she's done, we'll come back up and pray. Do we know where Carla's at? Sorry about that, guys. This one, or you want to use the mic? You can use the mic. The mic right here, yeah. Okay. David, has, David and I have been spending a lot of time together, especially this past month. And um, David and I were on our way up to Finley this week, and he said, Carl, I want a special testimony for Father's Day. And we, uh, we talked about people who could do it, you know, and he just didn't. Something just, you know, wasn't clicking. So I'm going to start, I'm going to back up now as to why I'm up here. Um, a month ago, Christmas, Christmas we received a message saying, um, uh, do you guys accept, you know, want to know about our Christmas Eve service? And then the next message was, do you accept anybody? And whoever answered, I don't know who it was, they said, yeah, you're welcome to come anytime you want to. So they didn't come. And then on May 17th, David and I met with a couple. And we got a message that says, can we meet with you? We want to plan a funeral. And, and David does not meet with um, a female by himself, so that's how I got involved. <laughs> So I, we met here, and the lady walks in, and she says, I want to plan my funeral. She said, um, they've given me 18 months to two years to live. And, okay, you know, she's um, had esophageal cancer, and now it was into her pancreas. She's in pancreatic cancer. So we sat there, and we talked, and... Um, she was not baptized, a baptized believer, and she says, I want to be baptized, too. And so then David did his part, you know, and he went through, he's really, he's really worked with these people a lot. So um, we met with them, and we've met, we've been to their house twice, and we've talked to them, and being baptized was so important to her. So this week, I get a call. Um, we're taking her, well, okay, let's just go back to last Wednesday. Last Wednesday, we meet at the church and um, talking about baptism again. So we're, we walk up here, we show them the baptistry. They've never seen it before, and she has to sit down. She says, I'm getting sick. So she sits down, and eventually she goes back to the bathroom. She does get sick. So this is Wednesday night. 
Thursday morning, she's sick. They call the doctor, and the doctor says, bring her in. So they, they took, her, took her into the doc hospital. And um, they want to run some tests on her. They're going to put a dye through her to see if it's going to her brain. And then they want to see if it's in her stomach. So I get a call back. It's around 2 o'clock from her friend, crying, sobbing. She said, it's worse than we thought. And um, they've given her two months to live. It was in her peritoneal, it's her stomach area, I had to look that up. It's in her stomach area. So uh, she said, can you guys get up here? So this is, this is Thursday night now. We get up there and we talk to him. Wants to be baptized, really, really wants to get baptized. Says we got to get her baptized. We've got to get her baptized. Oh yeah, they were. They were. They understood. I mean, it was. She knew. She knew. She wanted to be baptized. So, okay. But Thursday night, she was in too much pain. There was no way. She just. She was. She's one sick woman. And now we're at the point where she's. Um, Okay, two months to live. Friday morning, I get a phone call, or afternoon, I get a phone call and says, um, it's, it's getting worse. She's, she's not getting better and we need, we need you guys up here. So David and I go back up again. And uh, we're, huh? She's at eight breaths a minute right now. So we get up there and the, her room is full and she wants to be baptized. So um, Dave and I talked to the chaplain. We, we were told it wasn't feasible to have her baptized in the church, in the hospital. We called area hospitals, area churches, I mean, to see if, if they had portable baptistries. There was no help. So Dave and I are outside of her room in a waiting room. And by this time, David, he is yelling at God. And we're, we're sitting there, we're crying. You know, David's yelling at God, what can I do? David's phone rings. It's a nurse from Blanchard Valley Hospital. She says, you want to baptize, right? Baptize somebody. And David said, yeah. And uh, she says, we're going to go to the OB floor and put you in the, put you in the, the tub. Okay, so, and as I hear David and this nurse talking on the phone, I, I, I hear what David's saying, and then I hear the nurse talking, answering, I'm thinking, these two are right around the corner from each other. So I go out there and I say, are you talking to David? She says, yeah, and I said, well, he's right here. So, so anyway, we talk, and they talk, and she says, um, I, I, I'm going to help you. David said, how did you hear about us? And we still don't know that answer, do we, don't David? We don't even know her name. Uh, the family calls her Angel, is what the family's calling her. So her, the Angel nurse and, and two other nurses, they get Mary with pain medicine in her and loaded in the wheelchair. And, and they, bring, they bring Mary down. Mary's on the fifth floor, they bring her down to the third floor. Now Mary's got, besides Dave and I, they got, we got 10 people following us. And we're waiting out in the waiting room to get, um, to get the tub ready and get it all set up and stuff. And I'm, I'm looking at Mary in the wheelchair, the peace. Guys, she had peace. She, she knew she had so much peace within her. And Mary's mom was there, and um, Carla, Mary said, Carla, mom's having a rough time. So I went over and talked to mom. She says, I don't want to lose her. I said, I know you don't. I said, but she's going to a place that is no pain. She's going to, she's going to be able to walk. She's going to be able to do what Mary wants to do. 
So we all go back. And at that time, you know, everybody is crying. But a few guys, I don't know if you've seen the Facebook video. She gave us permission to put it on there. If you guys could have seen the peace that was in Mary's heart, it was just unbelievable. And if there's ever a trust in a father, you know, and I'm talking about our Heavenly Father now, she had it. She was a testimony to all of us, you know. So I called David up this morning. I said, did you get anybody to do a testimony? And he said, no. Nope. I said, I want to. I said, I just, I said, this is going to sound crazy, but I'm drying my hair, and Don comes in, and I said, how do you know if God's talked to you, Don? He said, well, if it's peaceful and you, and you heard, felt something. And that's what happened. God said, do the testimony about Mary. Do the testimony about our Heavenly Father. So if you haven't seen the video, you want to see it, we'll show it to you. Mary was a portrayal of, of trusting the Heavenly Father. And we did get the news. She has days to live now. So um, if you guys can pray, pray for comfort for the family. It's, it's, they need it. They do need it. There's something else we need to share with you guys. We really feel like we're at a point in our church here where we can make a tremendous breakthrough with certain sects of our society. Mary Burkett and Lori Burkett were a married couple. They were living a lesbian lifestyle. The first time we met them was here and we said, listen, they were nervous coming into this backwoods church, seeing this backwoods preacher that probably didn't understand a thing they were going through. And I say this not for feather and cap guys, but I say this because this is exactly what you guys can do. I said, you know, Mary and Lori, I said, we live in a society where if, we, if I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican, if we don't agree, then we have to hate each other. If I like the Reds and you like the Dodgers, if we don't agree, we have to hate each other. The days of conversations have left the building. Nobody wants to talk and, and love. And we told those girls that we said, listen, we do not agree with your lifestyle. But we love your soul. And we love you, the person. If you have anybody that's struggling with that, we'll love them, guys. We'll love them here. We'll love them here, and we'll let God's work touch their heart. The last thing those girls told us was, we got it. And Lori said, I'll never be with another person. I'm going, you know, she wants to be celibate. Mary, obviously, is celibate. We didn't just baptize them, though, guys. We taught them the word of God. But I wanted to tell you guys this today because you guys are responsible for this. We paid some bills for them because they didn't have any. That's from you guys. We put out one calls and you guys prayed for them. That's you guys. We got a whole sect of society, guys, that we can love on and let God's word because they have a soul like we do. Please pray for that family. Guys, I want to just close our time together, and I, I just want to pray. I'm not going to do my closing. I just want to pray that that we uh, we do what God has said. That we love people. My wife, she's quiet about certain things, and last week she got something on her phone, and she brought it to me, and she said, "It said." Instead of condemnation, why don't we start showering people with grace? We're not condoning their lives. But we do say that we are sinners just like you. And we love you. And it's because of all you guys this happened. Because of all you guys this happened. Let's pray. Father, we just, we thank you. And if we'll just open ourselves up to you. If we'll just say, here I am. Use me, God. It happens every day. Your wonders and your miracles amaze me. All we have to do, God, is say, let me be used by you. Thank you for the body of believers here, Lord. 
this is the greatest church in the world, God. Uh, this, this is just such a great place. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the love you've instilled in us through your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the joy you've given us through your Holy Spirit. But today we acknowledge you, not us. We acknowledge you, God. Your word says you added to the number daily those being saved. God, if we're truly the body of Christ, why, are, why is our hands and feet not moving? If we're truly the body of Christ, why are we not speaking? Why are we not standing up to evil? Father, continue to work with us. Consider, consider to have your kingdom fulfilled here in McGuffey. And thank you for the opportunity to meet with hurting people. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, just as always, you can have that today. Come just as you are up here. Confess him, Lord, as your Lord and Savior. Repent of your sins. Have your sins washed in the waters of baptism. If you'd like prayer, we can do prayer for you today. If you need some time to, to study the word, we can do that with you. Just come today, guys. Come just as you are. seated.
For a meditation time, I'd like to begin with uh, Psalm 37, uh, 23 through 24. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. We know there's only one perfect father out there, and that's God. And us as fathers, we know that we stumble a lot. But uh, one thing that we can remember, though, the Lord will uh, he'll grab our hand and get us back up always. So that's uh, comforting to know that. But as as we've mentioned many times today, this is Father's Day, and we are indeed grateful for the faith of our fathers. Being a father is an important job. It entails being a good provider, a caretaker, love giver, discipline enforcer. And then someone said that the greatest gift a father can give his kids is to love love their mother. (laughs) So uh, we certainly don't want to forget that. Some fathers have made wives proclamations about how their children should behave, but every father had better remember that one day their children are going to follow their example and not their advice. Being a father offers rewards beyond description. And of course, one thing that we all remember is fathers tucking our little ones into bed at night. That's something as a father you'll never forget, but this writing I want to read to you was uh, written about this. It was written by... uh, Hubert Parker. To get his good night kiss, he stood beside my chair one night and raised an eager face to me, a face with love delight. And as I gathered in my arms the son that God had gave me, I thanked the lad for being good and hoped he'd always be. His little arms crept around my neck, and then I heard him say four simple words I can't forget. Four words that make me pray. Four words that turned a mirror upon my soul on secrets that no one knew. Four words that startled me. I hear them yet. He said, I'll be like you. I'll be like you. So as Christians, we look to to Christ, our Lord and Master, for a perfect example on how to live. But our children look to us. Of course, now we uh, are preparing ourselves to to meet around the table and we just... uh, I want to offer thanks to our Heavenly Father for the sacrifice that he made. But guys, as fathers, we have no, we're, we've got a maid. We've got a great example to follow, and that's our Heavenly Father through his son, Jesus Christ. All we have to do is just know what his word says and, and follow his example. So what do we always ask ourselves? What are we taught as kids before we decide what to do or what not to do or how to do something? What, what should we be asking ourselves? What would, what would Jesus do? So really, you know, we can make it so simple on ourselves if we would just go through our daily lives and just ask, what would Jesus do? What is his example of how to handle the situation? So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, are truly grateful for another opportunity to remember what you created us for and what it's all about. Father, we just thank you that uh, you came to earth in the form of your son and you sent your son Jesus to the cross to die and suffer for us. Thank you, Jesus, for following your father's plan. Thank you for your blood that you shed that washes our sins. But Father, we know it didn't stop there. You raised Jesus from the dead, brought him back to life, And then ascended him to your right hand. There now. We're talking to him now. Just interceding with you through him. And Father we know that he's preparing us a place. And we're just so grateful that. We've heard the word. We believe the word. We've repented of our sin. Decided to. To move forward in the right direction that you teach us to. Father if there's something here that uh, we've done wrong. That would prevent us from wanting or needing or or not needing, but wanting to take these emblems. We just pray that we would ask your, seek your forgiveness. But Father, we just uh, thank you for the happiness that we can have as a Christian, just knowing the facts that we do and, and, and acting on them and accepting your amazing grace. We just know that as long as we put our relationship with you 
above all else in our life and, and, and love others around us as ourselves and, and just consider their needs more than ours, we'll be happy. So, Father, we thank you, and we just ask a blessing upon this bread and this juice, which uh, physically and reminds us of the beaten and bruised body of Christ and the blood that he shed for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. stand as we close with prayer. Almighty God, again, we just thank, give thanks for this opportunity to come into your house, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you for all the fathers in this special day, dear Lord, but we most of all thank you for the father that you've ex- modeled and example to each and every one of us, dear Lord. We uh, thank you for your son. We love him, dear Lord. We ask your guide, guidance and direction upon each and every one of us here today, dear Lord, we ask that you guide and direct us and bring us into this house in one week's time. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, folks, say it with me. Love God, love people, share Jesus. Have a great week, everybody.